Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and start the second half of this unit. Hopefully, again, you had a chance to fill in this entire T-chart with some of your notes you took um, on these previous few slides that had some information about the three different animals. Um, and then also there were some uh, observations that you should have made based on the shared structures they had of their front limbs. So now that we've got that done, we wanna start to think a little bit more deeply um, about how might these specific structures support the animal in its environment. So here are some things that I jotted down when I was going through and making some of my observations. So if you see something in here maybe that you did not have or that you think is important, go ahead and take a second to add that to yours. Um, you can also do the same for where they lived and how they survived. Mine is not necessarily perfect. There might be some information in there that you don't think is super helpful, um, but there might also be some information that you realize you missed that you do want to get taken down for your notes. So we'll just click through these and feel free to pause the video and add any notes for your specific species that you see in uh, these boxes here. Here's the one for the fruit bat. And then lastly, here's the one for our Titanolophus. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start to figure out, okay, what are some of the things for each of these organisms that would have supported it in its environment? So really what we're going to be thinking about is how might the environment influence each species structure? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the thinking that I want you to be doing um, and I'm gonna kind of model that thinking for you with the wolf. Then your job will be to start to think about the structures of the fruit bat and the titanolophus and think about how would their structure, remember that's the way that front limb is made up, how is that going to um, be influenced by where they live and what they need to survive? So let me uh, kind of give you an example of what the thinking that you're gonna wanna be doing uh, might sound like in your head. So when we look at the wolf here, what we're gonna notice is that, oops, is that it has some long uh, finger-like bones and some are bent flat and others are a part of the leg. It's got some claws and I noticed that it has some very bendy fingers. So a couple things that I started to think about were that well, predator, as a predator, it's gonna need something to be able to capture its prey. So that's where its claws probably come in. If it was something that ate grass, like a cow, um, or maybe in a second here when we start to look more into the titanolophus, we might see that the ends of their fingers um, are things that don't have claws on them. But the wolf makes sense to me that as a predator, it would have those claws. Those two things might be related. Uh, other things that I noticed is that the wolf needed to run. It needed to hunt and kill large organisms. So one of the things that I noticed was that it also has uh, some bent flat parts and other parts of its legs that are not very bent. So that one's a little bit tricky to think about, but when I was thinking about it, I kind of thought about it as a spring and some things that were uh, squishy and could move as it's running to kind of cushion its running ability, but then it also needed uh, bones that were long and hard to be able to provide structure to push off of the ground. So what I would love for you to do now is take a look at the fruit bat and take a look at the titanolophus. What I did was I highlighted some things that may uh, be pieces of the environment that influence that species structure. So what I want you to do is go ahead and pause. You may want to even jot this down and answer this question. What are some of the pieces of the environment that could have influenced the specific structures of those species limbs? So we did the wolf together. You may want to write down your answer that we went over for that. But at this point in the video, go ahead and pause and think about the fruit bat and think about the titanolophus answering this question right here.
All right. Hopefully you pause the video and thought through those two organisms. If you didn't, now is a good time to pause and go ahead and rewind this video just a little bit. The next section we're going to be working on has uh, some pieces that you're going to be looking at a simulation. So if you are someone who at home has access to the simulation in uh, Amplify, what I want to really encourage you to do is make sure that you are opening up that simulation and completing this yourself. There's going to be a few different options. I'm going to give you an option for if you do have access to the simulation and you want to walk through that. I'm going to give you some directions for if you don't have the simulation at home, but you want to work through the thinking independently. And then the last kind of option that you have is I'm going to walk through in the simulation some of the thinking that you might do independently. So I want to really encourage you if you do have that simulation to go ahead and open it up now. What you're going to do is access that simulation by opening it up in Amplify. And today we're going to be clicking on this mammals icon. So if you do have access to the simulation, what I would encourage you to do is go ahead and go into Amplify right now, open that up, I'll walk you through how to do that, and then what you can do is work through these next two slides that are blue. So each of them are labeled as access to the simulation, and on the first slide, you're gonna see this is your goal, this is what you're working on in the simulation, and then these are some tips to help you get started once you get in there. Finally, once you've got the two species opened up that you are going to be examining, there are three questions that you want to answer and work through. So let's go ahead, for those of you that do have the simulation at home, I'll show you how to make sure you are opening that up correctly. So whatever method you usually use to log into Amplify is gonna be what you are opening up with. I log on here. I'm gonna go ahead and start to get logged on. Okay, hopefully my internet will let me get logged on here. There we go. And then when you get into Amplify, you want to make sure, remember, we're starting in a new chapter. Mine automatically logs me into that old lesson that we were working on, lesson 1.4. So go ahead and make sure that you are opening up chapter 2, and we are working in 2.1. Within 2.1, we're working on this last activity, activity 4. And so you want to click on activity 4, and then go ahead and the link will open you up and load that new simulation. So like I said, if you're working at home, remember you're gonna be working on those two blue slides. You wanna click right here where it says mammals. And then you're gonna notice that you've got all of your mammals over here. So um, I'm gonna go back into my presentation. If you do have that simulation at home, now's your time, pause the video and work through these next two slides. All right, if you don't have the simulation at home, but you'd like to work on this independently, um, these next two green slides are gonna be the ones that you're gonna to wanna to be focusing on. So when you see the green background, this one there's a lot of information, so there's not a ton of green, but these green, this green background is gonna be what you want to work through. So when you get into the simulation, which you aren't gonna to need to do um, if you don't have access to it, there's two species that it's going to want us to compare, the Cachetius and the Smilodon, or the saber-toothed tiger. I love that name because it has a very unique smile with those giant fangs up there at the front of its mouth. So you're going to be answering the same questions as we looked at before. So for you, you're going to want to pause the video here, preview those questions, and then go back to this slide right here so that you can start to compare some of the structures within these two organisms. 
what you're going to notice is like we talked about at the beginning of our lesson, they're going to have some shared structures. And some of their shared structures are going to be really similar. And some of them are going to be slightly different, even though they share that structure. So in here, it's going to ask you to discuss some of those similarities and then also make sure that you have read about what was their environment like, um, just like we practiced before. So you can start to think about how might their unique structure be related to the environment in which they live. So go ahead, if you are gonna to wanna to work through independently on these green two slides, pause the video, rewind it a little bit, and go ahead and start to answer these questions right here. All right, if you don't have access to the simulation and you're wanting to think through this together with me, um, we're gonna go ahead and do this on these next few red slides. So you're going to be wanting to write down the same questions, the same answers. I'm going to talk through them. So you're going to want to be making sure that you are listening really closely because uh, in the last section when we practiced together, I kind of showed you what my notes were. For this section, I'm not going to do that. So what you want to be doing is making sure you're listening to what exactly am I saying we are which structure are we going to be talking about? And then what are some of the differences that we're talking about with those shared structures? So let's go ahead and go into the simulation and we're going to pull up those two species. So this map is showing us where we found all of those different mammals. Um, and the two mammals that we are going to be studying is the first one we're going to be studying is the Smilodon or the saber-toothed cat. Um, and then the other one, if you scroll through here, here it is, uh, the Cuchicetus, which is tricky to say, the Cuchicetus, the pronunciation is right here. Um, so here we've got our information about those two organisms. Uh, the saber-toothed tiger, it says, which is kind of no surprise, it says it was a predator with those giant teeth. Um, and they became extinct about 10,000 years ago. The Smilodon was a little bit shorter than a lion, but it weighed twice as much and had powerful legs. So now that should start to make me think, okay, I want to be listening closely because it's starting to talk about its legs and that is what we are going to be comparing one of those limbs to the limbs of the Cuchicetus. It also says that it lived in social groups like lions do today, but unlike the lion, the Smilodon had a very short tail and very long canine teeth, up to seven inches long. That is crazy. Those are some huge teeth. It also says that the Smilodon hunted large herbivores such as bison by sneaking up on the animals and ambushing them using its saber teeth to deliver a quick fatal stab. So we've got a little bit of background on the saber-toothed cat. Let's bounce over here and read about the Cuchicetus. It says the Cuchicetus was a small otter-like mammal that lived about 45 million years ago. Cuchicetus lived in tropical seas. Their small hind legs were probably not very helpful for swimming. So they used their large tails to propel them through water. These animals had a layer of fat under their skin called blubber, just as whales have today. The blubber covered the entire areas of their body and helped keep them warm. So that's a little bit of background information for us to think about. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, we can click on the appearance thing here. It's just gonna show us what those might have looked like in real life. Um, the saber-toothed tiger is pretty cool looking if you ask me. Uh, the Cuchicetus is not quite as cute as uh, an otter in my personal opinion. It's kind of got a funny looking head, but you might think differently. Uh, so the main piece that we want to look into next is we want to look into one feature that they have that is similar, one structure I should say that they have that's similar, and start to think about what are some of the differences in those features. So I'm going to just zoom in here a little bit so that we can start to take a look and think about what are some of the differences that we're noticing.
So I'm starting to notice a few things that are different, even though they share the structure. Just as a reminder, before I go into modeling how I'm thinking about these different structures, you're going to want to make sure that you are answering for yourself these questions. So I'm going to start by highlighting the structure and talking about what are some of the differences I see. You may want to even pause the video right now and realize like, hey, I don't need the support. I'm going to go ahead and look and compare between these two things independently. And that is totally fine. So the first thing that I am going to uh, zoom in on here is I'm going to start to look at uh, actually two structures. I'm going to look at the radius and the ulna. And those are kind of those lower bones in their limbs. And when I read about the saber-toothed tiger, it said that they needed to be able to uh, ambush their prey and attack them, which is telling me that they have got to be pretty fast and they've got to be pretty strong in order to be able to attack their predators. In fact, I'm also noticing that these bones are pretty large. And they, in the reading, it also stated that a, the Smilodon weighs about twice as much as a lion, which means that they have got a lot of weight to hold. So in my mind, I'm starting to think that maybe one of the reasons why these are long and quite a bit bigger than our Cuchicetus over here is because they need to be able to support that Smilodon in being a strong animal that can run fast and ambush its prey. And also they've got a lot of weight that they can support. Now, if I look over here at the Cuchicetus, I'm gonna notice that these bones are really quite a bit smaller. Um, even in comparison, the Cuchicetus, yes, it is smaller, but if we think about overall, those bones are quite a bit thinner than the bones of the Smilodon. And what I may be thinking is that that is because this animal, uh, like it said down here, lived in the sea. So they probably aren't walking around a lot. And it also said that these aren't necessarily the main things that they use to swim, but instead they use their tail, which I'm noticing is really long. So for me, I might jot down that the radius and the ulna of this Cuchicetus is quite a bit smaller than the Smilodon, and that that probably has to do with the fact that they're not attacking prey, they're not spending most of their time on land. So go ahead and if you didn't get a chance to fill in these three questions, you're gonna to wanna to rewind the video and take a second to compare the structures of those two individual species. Um, this is gonna wrap up our lesson, so make sure you're spending some time finishing up and practicing thinking about those differences. Because in the last, uh, chapter, we narrowed down between a whale and uh, the wolf as what our mystery fossil is most similar to. But now what we want to start to think about is why are there actually those differences? So we're going to continue that thinking in our next lesson. So I'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye for now.